I'm located in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. I work at Children's Mercy Hospital at a, at a research center that is actually a joint research center between Children's Mercy and KU Med Center. So it's a, it's a joint facility. We just happen to be located at Children's Mercy Hospital. But it's a really nice center because we've got researchers, clinicians, uh, community-based workers, and advocates all in the same building. And it's really kind of a unique uh, unique setting. So before I get too far, I just want to thank everybody who helped me with this study. So uh, my energy balance research team in Kansas City, there's a nice picture of all of us. Um, additionally, the, the, they helped me collect all the data. So um, uh, that was a big effort. It's been an even larger effort, though, uh, to work on some of the measurement error modeling that I'm going to share today. Uh, and uh, I'll describe a little bit about how we came about this, but uh, it really started with conversations I had with uh, Dr. Danny Reese when he was a graduate student at Iowa State University. He's now at the Sandia National Labs. Uh, he's got a full-time job, and, uh, but he's still working on this project for free because he's really interested in, in it. And uh, my main collaborator at Children's Mercy, uh, Henry Ye, who is a biostatistician. Uh, and, and he helped do uh, a lot of the modeling that I'm going to share today. Uh, this project was funded uh, through ILSI. This came out of the 2016 Tech Summit, um, so I'm happy to uh, describe the results um, for the past two years of work here. I have no disclosures. Uh, so I've been interested in energy balance for uh, several years now, and I've been particularly interested in using energy balance to calculate uh, or estimate energy intake for about five years or so. And um, I, I was not the first to do this by any means. Uh, Diana Thomas, Kevin Hall, who Jim mentioned, um, uh, Dale Scholler at Wisconsin, they've done a lot of this work prior to me, and they've really kind of um, developed the, the evidence for using this theory or, or this principle, which is the intake balance technique, which is essentially if you can... Um, if you can measure two pieces of the energy balance equation, you can calculate the third. So for example, if you can calculate energy storage and energy expenditure with a high rate of validity, you can then back calculate energy intake. And you can calculate energy storage using the equation that you, that you see here, where you can measure the change in fat-free mass and the change in fat mass over a given period of time because we know that one kilogram of fat-free mass is about 1,000 calories, and one kilogram of fat-free mass is about 9,500 calories. And from that equation, you can get energy storage, then you can uh, measure energy expenditure using a variety of methods and come at an estimate of energy intake, with the hope being that calculated energy intake is superior to self-reported energy intake. And so I, I did, uh, I published a paper, this was a couple years ago, using um, 200 individuals. We had doubly labeled water on all of these uh, young adults. And uh, while they were wearing the doubly labeled water, they were wearing a research-grade activity monitor, the Senseware. So we, as, or we uh, measured whether energy expenditure from the Senseware was as good as energy expenditure from doubly labeled water to calculate energy intake. And we found that the group average was almost identical uh, between either doubly labeled water or senseware. But we found lots of variability in that response. And so here's just one figure that we had. And as you can see, um, zero would be perfect agreement between the two methods. Uh, but there was a lot of discrepancy, a lot of variability around that mean. And so uh, I was interested in, in kind of um, really two things. One is reducing that variability and or, or reducing that variability and then also can we use something other than a research grade device uh, to measure energy expenditure? How about a consumer device? Uh, so this was done while I was at Iowa State University. I met uh, Danny Reese and his supervisor Alicia Caraquiri. Um, they, Alicia has had several uh, NIH grants and USDA grants uh, to develop measurement error models around self-reported um, uh, energy intake and dietary recalls. Uh, but no one had done this in physical activity or really energy balance. They subsequently did get a grant to look at 
measure airman modeling and physical activity. Uh, Greg Welk was the PI on that. That should be uh, coming out soon, those results. Um, but no one had done it on energy balance. And so we worked with Danny throughout his dissertation and we published a, a, a paper in PLOS One that was really a technical paper that really described the things that we were interested in doing. Um, so I can share either of those papers with, with um, anyone who's interested. Um, <clears throat> and the idea, what Danny was proposing is this, um, that, that linear measurement error modeling can really help us reduce the variability in our estimates. And um, this is um, very advanced level statistics. Um, and so I, I, I am not the expert in this. This is why I rely on my colleagues for it. Um, but the short version is, um, with, if we think back to statistics that we all took at some point in time, there is the true distribution of responses for any given variable, and then the actual distribution of, of responses. Um, and while the true and actual means may be the same, there is vastly different distribution in those responses and larger error, larger variance. And so what linear measurement error modeling tries to do is partition the variance that we see in actual measurements into true variance and measurement error. And one of the, the unique points about it is um, this technique treats the values of each subject as additional parameters to be used. So for example, in the study that I'm gonna share, we had 24 participants, we had two metrics um, per participant, so we actually had 48 additional parameters that we were using in our model to try to estimate what a true response would be. So we attempted to estimate the true value of energy expenditure and storage using gold standard and inexpensive measures. And so we used uh, DEXA to, uh, to be our gold standard for energy storage, double label, doubly labeled water as our gold standard for energy expenditure, the intake balance technique for energy intake, and then our inexpensive measures were the Fitbit ARIA Wi-Fi scale for body composition and the Fitbit Alta HR activity monitor. Each of these, I think, cost about $150 when we did the study. They've dropped to maybe $130 as compared to um, $775 for doubly labeled water and the DEXA machine itself costs hundreds of uh, hundred thousand dollars or so in addition to having a tech and, and all of that. Uh, and then we also did dietitian administered recalls. Um, oops. There we go. I think yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I should take take a step back. The title that's listed in the program, if you if you notice, it says something about uh, estimation of energy balance in rural, uh, rural adolescents or rural children. That was the original proposal. Uh, it was a partner to, it was an ancillary study to an R01 that was a multi-site rural Kansas intervention. The site that we were to recruit our participants from failed to adequately, re adequately recruit for the R01, and so it actually was dropped. And so we had to scramble and figure out what we were going to do. So we um, uh, did essentially the same study, but only in, in adults. Um, and, and here's what we had those participants do. They came in on day zero. Um, they gave background urine samples. They did a DEXA scan. Afterwards, they immediately stepped on the ARIA Wi-Fi scale. They were dosed for double labeled water. We measured their resting metabolic rate. And then we collected urine samples um, later on that day, and then also at day seven, um, which they did at home, and then they returned on day 14 for a second DEXA scan and a fourth urine sample for doubly labeled water. During that 14-day period, they wore the Fitbit Alta wrist activity monitor continuously. Um, we instructed them not to take it off at all, uh, and they also stepped on the ARIA scale daily. Uh, first thing in the morning after their first void of the day. Um, so we have continuous energy expenditure variables and daily measures of body composition. They did a 14-day washout period after that two-week period, and then they repeated that entire protocol one additional time. So we have four weeks of data on all of our participants. And just to give you an example of the data that we have, um, so 
In blue, we see part, uh, the body composition data from the scale for participant 4001, a 23-year-old female, fairly sedentary, about 4,300 steps per day. Um, her body composition, as measured by the ARIA scale, uh, started out on the first day as 25.8, went up to 28.2, so 3%, uh, three percentage points increase. In the second assessment period, it was actually a little bit more stable. Uh, our DEXA measurements on that time are uh, on day 0, 14, um, uh, 15, and 28 uh, were fairly consistent but higher than the ARIA um, at each time point. Um, for doubly labeled water energy expenditure, um, time period one, it was 2176. Time two was 1933. The daily energy expenditure from the Fitbit um, was a, a little all over the uh, period, all over the place during the first assessment period. Uh, this particular day, they were very, very active, much more active than they normally were, about 10,000 steps over that level, so about 15,000 steps, so higher energy expenditure. It was much more consistent during the second period. Um, here is just a real quick overview of our participants, average age 31, average BMI, um, just about a uh, high end of normal weight. Um, so here are the actual values that, that we measured. Um, so again, DEXA scan, uh, they did it four times. It was actually relatively consistent uh, across all four visits. And the Fitbit actually gave us fairly consistent body composition measures as well for visits two, three, and four. It was just a little higher for that first visit for whatever reason. Um, for energy storage, which we calculated from change in energy in uh, body composition over each two-week period, um, was much higher using the Fitbit Aria during time one, and it's all because of um, this higher um, percent body composition and actually a higher body weight as well. Uh, the scale just didn't seem to be quite as sensitive as our lab scales for measuring body weight. Uh, but for time two, for whatever reason, it was much closer. For energy expenditure, we were generally very close. Uh, the two devices, it was about 70, excuse me, about 20 calories during time point one and about 70 calories for time point two. So pretty good, actually, for the Fitbit devices. And then when we calculated energy intake, um, uh, we had about 2,400 calories for both periods using the, the gold standard measures. Uh, the Fitbit, because we were off for energy storage in time one, uh, we had a much lower calculated energy intake in time one. It was about the same as self-reported energy intake. But during time point two, where for whatever reason storage was a little bit more accurate, our energy intake was also more accurate. Okay? All right. Um, I'm just going to skip over this for time. Um, so those are just same straight descriptive methods. Uh, um, now we get into the actual measure, measurement error modeling. And so I've got one slide here. This is actually the bulk of the work that has been done. There's a whole technical paper that's 10 pages long that describes exactly what we are attempting to do here. Uh, here, here is just the quick overview. It's a Bayesian semi-parametric approach. We used R in this very specific programming la language. And really, most of the work um, in the modeling comes with these assumptions that we make about the error terms. Um, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of matrix variations that they test and retest. Uh, ultimately, they use this what's called an inverse uh, Wizard prior. Um, now, let's get to the actual data. So the true energy expenditure based on our modeling was 2,500 calories. And that's um, uh, compared to what the doubly labeled water was, was about 2,584, 2,490. Uh, for the Alta, it was about 2,600 and 2,567. Uh, so it was actually a little bit lower than most of our estimates of doubly labeled water and um, from the Fitbit device. Now, this graph is a little uh, uh, hard to read, but this is essentially a plot of all the, of all the energy expenditure measurements that were taken on our individuals uh, on, excuse me, on the y-axis. Then on the x-axis, we have what we believe the true measure was. So, for example, if we look at uh, 4,010, 
There are the four measurements for 4,010's energy expenditure. The true measure we estimated to be 2610. For doubly labeled water at uh, time one, it was estimated at 1650. For the uh, Fitbit at time one, 1816. For doubly labeled water at time two, 1911. And uh, for the Fitbit at, at time uh, two, 2424. So in this case, the true measure we believe was actually higher than any of the expenditure values that we measured. And um, that would make sense when we think about this individual. Uh, she's a 32-year-old female, BMI, uh, she's, over, she's obese, um, she gets about 7,300 steps per day, uh, but we were only calculating her energy expenditure using doubly labeled water as, you know, 1,700, 1,900 calories. That's likely too low. That's probably what a resting metabolic rate is. Um, when we look at energy storage, we see uh, a similar pattern. Uh, the true overall estimate was uh, negative 1,001, so they were all very slightly losing energy storage over, the, over a, a two-week period. Um, and these, again, were um, a little bit lower in some cases than the DEXA, um, a little bit closer to time two. If we look at 4,010, uh, data again. There's her data. We uh, estimated her true energy storage to be negative 104. Uh, using the DEXA time one, it was negative 463. Uh, the Fitbit time one, negative 660. Uh, DEXA time two, negative uh, 543. And Fitbit time two, negative 18. So again, we corrected those estimates to get uh, perhaps a, a more reasonable, true estimate of our energy storage. Um, and energy intake, I know we're all ultimately interested in that. Uh, we estimated her true energy intake to be 2506. Uh, I guess I'll say the group average first was 2602. Using the techniques, either the DEXA doubly labeled water and Fitbit, this was all actually higher than what those estimates were and much higher by about 500 calories, 400 calories from dietary recalls. So for this individual, um, again, we estimated her energy intake to be between uh, 1,100 to 2,000 calories per day. That makes sense that that's probably too low. Um, we think it's probably closer to 2,506 using a true, uh, using the true, uh, estimate of energy intake based on this modeling. So um, this is uh, very initial results. This is a very small pilot study, um, but I think that there are some promising things to take away from it. Um, there is still large variability. I kind of skipped over our root mean square error data. Um, so there, there's still work to be done, uh, but I think this is a good first step. Um, very small pilot study. We think um, we're going to do a larger or, uh, power calculation um, soon. We think, a, a, of course, it depends on the, the techniques we use, but probably we'll, we need hundreds of participants to, to accurately develop these models. One thing that we're going to try next is we were just using um, time, essentially four time points um, for most of these estimates. So at the beginning of time one, end of time one. Beginning of time two, end of time two. We're now going to create a model with the daily inexpensive data. So um, day zero to one is a measurement. One to two is a measurement. Two to three, so on and so forth. We'll have that information for both energy expenditure and energy storage. So we're going to go from you know, 48 parameters to literally hundreds or thousands of parameters for the next model. Um, uh, we're going to do our power calculation. One thing that we're interested in is, is what is the trade-off between having gold standard measures and inexpensive measures? Can we just do one gold standard measure and then um, uh, multiple inexpensive measures uh, and get the same results? Um, we think that that might be a way to reduce our, uh, to maintain our power by reducing, our, uh, but main, maintaining our power 
but having a reasonable sample size. Um, and last thing, and David mentioned this at the beginning, and I think Jim mentioned it too, collaboration is really the key here. Um, it has taken, I've been talking with uh, these folks at Iowa State and now San Diego um, for four or five years, because uh, they're biostatistician, nutritionists, I'm an exercise physiologist by training. It takes a lot of time to meet each other, uh, to establish a relationship, and to figure out how to talk the same language, language. And we're still working on that. As you can imagine, apologies to any biostatisticians in the room, uh, it's not always a, as simple for an, a physiologist and a statistician to talk to each other. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you have to use multiple, multiple. Typical, I'll give you a typical research response. It depends. Um, so I'll say it depends. I, I will say that um, uh, the Fitbit device has performed much better than, than I anticipated, specifically the, the wrist-worn activity monitor. Um, the scale, there was a lot of variability, as, as we noted. Um, but it's hard to tell, this is a very small sample size, so if three or four participants were wildly off at, again, we only used one time point, say that first time point, um, they, she was off by 3%, that really dramatically reduces the ability um, to estimate energy balance. So um, I, I think it's probably a combination of techniques is where we're at right now. Hopefully, we can progress to other uh, more cheaper devices. Yes? I'm curious to kind of come back to that first point in the Fitbit, because otherwise, it, it did look pretty good. Yeah, if you had any, did you, from a data standpoint, did you have a small subset of people that were like wildly off? Did you, uh, I don't know if Fitbit is like an active part of your study at all. Did you go back to them and say, this is the same thing that they've, that they've seen? Like, I, I'm just curious what, mm -hmm. what might yeah, uh, Fitbit was not a partner. We don't know it, um, uh, so I haven't contacted them at all. They've, um, based on conversations at the Tech Summit, uh, I've heard that they are interested in collaborating, but they're un generally unwilling to, to share um, some of their trade secrets on, on why someone might be uh, discriminately off. Um, it, it could be any number of factors. Uh, we did see indivi some individuals wildly off, and they're throwing um, a lot of this data really um, uh, into a monkey wrench. I, I skipped over this one slide. I'll, I'll pull it up just so you can see the scatter plots, for example, of energy storage. Um, so this is DEXA and the Fitbit. And essentially, there's not, a, it's a correlation of 0.15. That's very, very low. Now, for the second time point, it, it did improve. Um, but, but really, there's a few people that are, are really pulling us off. So we're, we're still at the point where we're trying to figure out what, what is going on with those people. Yes? Just uh, two questions. The first is, hopefully, if, if you're doing a numeric study, it would be useful, instead of using the 24 hour recall pressure by Harrison's, to try the ASA 24, uh, because it's free. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. people can even into. Yeah. The second question, I, I just don't know about the scale. Is it, it, it me it's measured in body composition? Yes, through bioelectrical impedance. Yeah, okay, does it get a hydration of lean body mass and adipose? Because they're, because they're. Ye yes, it does. Uh, it does not, this particular scale does not give hydration levels. It only gives percent body composition, which then you can uh, be used to carpentalize the, the body into fat mass and fat-free mass. Uh, the, I'm tr we're trying out the um, Garmin scale right now, and it does give a measure of body water, so it can get at the issue of hydration status. That's probably a really big point of error yeah, in the scale. Hydration, hydration of the, of the tissues. Of yeah. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, it, it would not provide that level of detail that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yes. So the double bagel water is a gold standard, but it doesn't give you the day-to-day -day variation at all. Correct. So it is kind of frustrating. Exactly. Because, you know, there's really just average being out there for as long as the period, right? So yes, that is, that's exactly right. And there are ways to, to estimate physical activity level, for example, mm -hmm. um, from that. But um, that's, that's uh, um, uh, an interesting benefit of the Fitbit is right. the Fitbit, I didn't share any of this, we get steps and we get time in sedentary, light, moderate, and vigorous activity, all, all from a wrist-worn device. All those things are very uh, useful to know. Also, I just want to let you know there's a public use data set out there from the NPI that you got. Do you know about the iData study? It's got 1,000 people with double bagel water. It's got yes. all sorts of physical activity. It doesn't have the DEXA and other things. Yeah. Like, but maybe when you sorted things out, you could play with your modeling and apply it to different data. Yeah, we were actually just talking about that this week. Um, and, and we were going to look into what all the variables were available. So and the thanks next for year we'll be adding data from two other like cohorts that are being studied and are using the data. So Great. Yeah, so um, uh, definitely I want to do adolescence. I, a lot of my research is in adolescence, so other research that I'm doing, and so it would be helpful to have, to have this knowledge for that research. One problem with these devices is, um, I, I can't remember what the Fitbit is, but you know it's not recommended for under, I think, 13 or 14. Um, they do have, Garmin has a, has a, um, a VivoFit Junior, which is a, a, a Design for children. We don't know a lot about how these, um, what information uh, these devices are collecting and how they're calculating energy expenditure, for example. So that would be a, a large barrier to us. But Garmin is actually located in Kansas City. We're trying really hard to create a, a research partnership with them to, to look at this a little bit more. Uh, so definitely, I'd like to, to expand this. Anyone yeah. on the phone? No, we haven't. Um, that's actually, you know, kind of on our, on my personal next step slide is to reach out to her to to um, uh, get her thoughts on, on this a little bit more. So um, at the moment, we're just focusing on the the error modeling, but I think that that's that that's another key next step. And Diana's great because she she really gets it. Um, uh, as a mathematician, that can be hard to. Uh, can be hard to find, um, but but she gets the implications of it. Absolutely. Um, I was just going to ask a question. The hydration question sort of my thinking because I use assessment like activity monitors, using sensor wear a lot, so I know that. Um, but in thinking about it from the intervention standpoint and thinking about these kinds of devices, we do so much coaching in the research setting to get the accurate measures. So like stepping on the scale, like saying you need to be drinking water, you're well hydrated, so that we get mm -hmm. accuracy. In Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, uh, again, we have very specific um, instructions for them on when to use it, blah, blah, blah. I, I think a natural extension of this is to then develop error modeling techniques that do not have the strict restrictions that we did. So step on the scale at any time point throughout the day. Um, wear the activity monitor eight hours a day, whatever. Um, and I think that that through the power of data, 
I think we can develop those models because like I said, we can go very soon from having 48 parameters in the model to hundreds of parameters in the model. And if we scale that up to 100 participants, it'll be tens of thousands of parameters. So I think that that will really help. Yeah. But it, uh, I think that that's the natural extension. Yeah. Thank you.